This is Winter Girls by Lori Halls Anderson. The Pact. I took the knife out of my pocket and cut my palm just a little. I swear to be the skinniest girl in school, skinnier than you. Cassie's eyes got big as the blood pooled in my hand. She grabbed the knife and slashed her palm. I bet I'll be skinnier than you. No, don't make it a bet. Let's be skinniest together. Okay, but I'll be skinnier. One point zero zero. So she tells me the words dribbling out with the cranberry muffin crumbs, commas dunked in her coffee. She tells me in four sentences. No, five. I can't let I can't let me hear this, but it's too late. The facts sneak in and stab me. When she gets to the worst part, body found in a motel room alone. My walls go up and my doors lock. I nod like I'm listening, like we're communicating, and she never knows the difference. It's not nice when girls die. 2.00 We didn't want you hearing it at school or on the news. Jennifer crams the last hunk of muffin into her mouth. Are you sure you're okay? I open the dishwasher and lean into the cloud of steam that floats out of it. I wish I could crawl in and curl up between a bowl and a plate. My stepmother, cross out. Jennifer could lock the door, twist the dial to scald and press on. The steam freezes when it touches my face. I'm fine, I lie. She, <coughs> she reaches for the box of oatmeal raisin cookies on the table. This must feel awful. She rips off the cardboard ribbon. Worse than awful. Can you get me a clean container? I take a clear plastic box and lid out of the cupboard and hand it across the island to her. Where's dad? He had a tenure meeting. Who told you about Cassie? She crumbles the edges of the cookies before she puts them in the box to make it look like she baked instead of bought. Your mother called late last night with the news. She wants you to see Dr. Parker right away instead of waiting for your next appointment. What do you think? I ask. It's a good idea, she says. I'll see if she can fit you in this afternoon. Don't bother. I pull out the top rack of the dishwasher. The glasses vibrate with little screams when I touch them. If I pick them up, they'll shatter. There's no point. She pauses in mid-crumble. Cassie was your best friend. Not anymore. I'll see Dr. Parker next week like I'm supposed to. I guess it's your decision. Will you promise me you'll call your mom and talk to her about it? Promise. Jennifer looks at the clock on the microwave and shouts, Emma, four minutes. My stepsister crossed out. Emma doesn't answer. She's in the family room, hypnotized by the television and a bowl of blue cereal. Jennifer nibbles a cookie. I hate to speak ill of the dead, but I'm glad you didn't hang out with her anymore. I push the top rack back in and pull out the bottom. Why? Cassie was a mess. She could have taken you down with her. I reached for the steak knife hiding in the nest of spoons. The back handle is warm. As I pull it free, the blade slices the air, dividing the kitchen into sil slivers. There is Jennifer, packing store-bought cookies in a plastic tub for her daughter's class. There is Dad's empty chair, pretending he has no choice about these early meetings. There is the shadow of my mother, who prefers the phone because face-to-face -face takes too much time and usually ends in screaming. Here stands a girl clutching a knife. There is grease on the stove, blood in the air and angry words piled in the corners. We are trained not to see it, not to see any of it. Body found in a motel room alone. Someone just ripped off my eyelids. Thank God you're stronger than she was. Jennifer drains her coffee mug and wipes the crumbs from the corners of her mouth. The knife slides into the butcher block with a whisper. Yeah. I reach for a plate, scrubbed free of blood and gristle. It weighs 10 pounds. She snaps the lid on the box of cookies. I have a late settlement appointment. Can you take Emma to soccer? Practice starts at 5. Which field? Richland Park. Out past the mall. Here. She hands the heavy mug to me. Her, lips her lipstick, a bloody crescent on the rim. I set it on the counter and unload the plates one at a time, arms shaking. Emma comes into the kitchen and sets her cereal bowl, half filled with sky-colored milk, next to the sink. Did you remember the cookies? She asks her mother. Jennifer shakes the plastic container. We're late, honey. Get your stuff. Emma trudges toward her backpack, her sneaker laces flopping. She should still be sleeping, but my father's wife 
drives her to school early four mornings a week for violin lessons and conversational French. Third grade is not too young for enrichment, you know. Jennifer stands up. The fabric of her skirt is pulled so tight over her thighs the pockets gape open. She tries to smooth out the wrinkles. Don't let Emma con you, con you into, buying, into buying chips before practice. If she's hungry, she can have a fruit cup. Should I stick around and drive her home? She shakes her head. The Grants will do it. She takes her coat off the back of the chair, puts her arms in the sleeves, and starts to button up. Why don't you have one of the muffins? I bought oranges yesterday. Or you could have toast or frozen waffles. Because I can't let myself want them. Crossed out. Because I don't need a muffin. 410. I don't want an orange. 75. Or toast. 87. And waffles. 180. Make me gag. I point to the empty bowl on the counter next to the huddle of pill bottles and the blueberry dazzle pops box. I'm having cereal. Her eyes dart to the cabinet where she had taped up my meal plan. It came with the discharge papers when I moved in six months ago. I took it down three months later on my 18th birthday. That's too small to be a full serving, she says carefully. I could eat the entire box, crossed out. I probably won't even fill the bowl. My stomach's upset. She opens her mouth again, hesitates. A sour puff of coffee-stained morning breath blows across the still kitchen and splashes into me. Don't say it. Don't say it. Trust, Leah. She said it. That's the issue, especially now. We don't want... If I weren't so tired, I'd shove trust and issue down the garbage disposal and let it run all day. I pull a bigger bowl out of the dishwasher and put it on the counter. I am fine, okay? She blinks twice and finishes buttoning her coat. Okay, I understand. Tie your sneakers, Emma, and get in the car. Emma yawns. Hang on. I bend down and tie Emma's laces, double knotted. I look up. I can't keep doing this, you know. You're way too old. She grins and kisses my forehead. Yes, you can, silly. As I stand up, Jennifer takes two awkward steps toward me. I wait. She is pale, round... Round moth, dusted with eggshell foundation, armed for the day with her banker's briefcase, purse, and remote starter for the least SUV. She flutters, nervous. I wait. This is where we should hug or kiss or pretend to. She ties the belt around her middle. Look, just keep moving today, okay? Try not to think about things too much. Right. Say goodbye to your sister, Emma, Jennifer prompts. Bye, Leah. Emma waves and gives me a small, berry-dazzle smile. The cereal is really good. You can finish the box if you want. 3.00 I pour too much cereal, 150, in the bowl, splash on the 2% milk, 125. Breakfast in breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Breakfast will make me a champion. When I was a real girl with two parents in one house and no blades flashing, Breakfast was granola topped with fresh strawberries, always eaten while reading a book propped up on the fruit bowl. At Cassie's house, we'd eat waffles with thin syrup that came from maple trees, not the fake corn syrup stuff, and we'd read the funny pages. No, I can't go there. I won't think. I won't look. I won't pollute my insides with blueberry dazzle pops or muffins or scritch scratchy shards of toast either. Yesterday's dirt and mistakes have moved through me. I am shiny and pink inside, clean. Empty is good, empty is strong. But I have to drive. I drove last year, windows down, music cranked, first Saturday in October, flying to the SATs. I drove so Cassie could put the top coat on her nails. We were s secret sisters with a plan for world domination, potential bubbling around us like champagne. Cassie laughed, I laughed, we were perfection. Did I eat breakfast? Of course not. Did I eat dinner the night before, or lunch, or anything? The car in front of us braked as the traffic light turned yellow, then red. My flip-flop hovered over the pedal. My edges blurred. Black squiggle tingles curled up my spine and wrapped around my eyes like a silk scarf. The car in front of us disappeared. The steering wheel, the dashboard, vanished. There was no Cassie, no traffic light. How was I supposed to stop this thing? Cassie screamed in slow motion. Marshmallow air explosion bag. When I woke up, the EMT person and a cop were frowning. The driver whose car I smashed into was screaming into his cell phone. 
My blood pressure was that of a cold snake. My heart was tired. My lungs wanted to nap. They stuck me with a needle, inflated me like a state fair balloon, and shipped me off to the hospital with steel-eyed nurses who wrote every, who wrote down every bad number in pen, busted me. Mom and Dad rushed in, side by side, for a change, happy that I was not dead. A nurse handed my cart, my chart to my mother. She read through it and explained the disaster to my father, and then they fought, a mudslide of an argument that spewed across the antiseptic sheets and out into the hall. I was stressed, overscheduled, manic, no, depressed, no, in need of attention, no, in need of discipline, in need of rest, in need, your fault, your fault, fault, fault. They branded their war on this tiny skin bag of a girl. Phone calls were made. My parents force marched me into hell on the hill, crossed out, new seasons. Cassie escaped, as usual, not a scratch. Insurance more than covered the damage, so she wound up with a fixed car and new speakers. Our mothers had a little talk, but really all girls go through these things, and what are you going to do? Cassie rescheduled for the next test and got her nails done at a salon. Enchanted blue. Wow, they locked me up and dripped sugar water into my empty veins. Lesson learned. Driving requires fuel. Not Emma's blueberry blueberry dazzle pop cereal. I shivered and I shiver and pour most of the soggy mess down the disposal, then set the bowl on the floor. Emma's cats, Cora and Pluto, pat across the kitchen and stick their heads in the bowl. I draw a cartoon face with a big tongue on a sticky note. Write, yummy Emma, thanks, and slap it on the cereal box. I eat 10 raisins, 16, and 5 almonds, 35, and a green-bellied pear, 121, equals 127. The bites crawl down my throat. I eat my vitamins and the crazy seeds that keep my brain from exploding. One long purple, one fat white, two poppy red. I wash everybody down with hot water. They better work quick. The voice of a dead girl is waiting for me on my phone. 4.00. The climb upstairs takes longer than usual. I sleep at the far end of the hall in the tiny space still decorated like a guest room. White walls, yellow curtains. The sofa bed is never folded up. The desk came from a yard sale. Jennifer keeps offering to buy me new furniture and paint or put up wallpaper. I tell her I haven't figured out what I want to do yet. I should probably unpack the stacks of dusty boxes first. My phone is waiting on top of the pile of dirty clothes, right where it landed when I chucked it at the wall early Sunday morning because the constant ringing was making me crazy and I was too tired to turn it off. The last time she called me was six months ago after I got out of the hospital for the second time. I'd been calling her four or five times a day, but she wouldn't pick up or call me back until finally she did. She asked me to listen and told me this wouldn't take long. I was the root of all evil, Cassie said, a negative influence, a toxic shadow. While I was locked up, her parents had dragged her to a doctor who washed her brain and weighed her down with pills and empty words. She needed to move on with her life, redefine her boundaries, she said. I was the reason she cut classes and failed French and cause of everything nasty and dangerous. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I was the reason she didn't run away freshman year. I was the reason she didn't eat a bottle of sleeping pills when her boyfriend cheated on her. I listened for hours when her parents yelled and tried to stuff her into a mannequin shell that didn't fit. I understood what triggered her earthquakes, most of them. I knew how much it hurt to be the daughter of people who can't see you, not even if you're standing in front of them stomping your feet. But remembering all that was too complicated for Cassie. It was easier for her to dump me one last time. She turned my summer into a desert wasteland. When school started, she looked right through me in the halls. Her new friends draped around her neck, like Mardi Gras necklaces. She wiped me off the face of her existence. But something happened. In the dead time between Saturday night and Sunday morning, she called me. Of course I didn't pick up. She was drunk dialing or prank dialing. I wasn't going to let her sucker me into being her friend again just so she could turn around and crush me one more time. Body found in a motel room alone. I didn't pick up. I didn't listen to her messages yesterday. I was too angry to even look at the phone. She's still waiting for me. I sit down on the mound of unwashed pajama bottoms and sweatshirts and dig out my phone. Open it. Cassie called 33 times starting at 11.30 Saturday night. Retrieve voicemail. Leah, it's me. Call me. Cassie. Second message. Where are you? Call me back. Cassie. Third. 
I'm not playing, Overbrook. I really need to talk to you. Cassie, two days ago, Saturday. Call me. Please, please call me. Look, I'm sorry I was such a bitch, please. I know you're getting these messages. You can be mad at me later, okay? I really need to talk to you. You were right. It wasn't your fault. There's nobody else to talk to. Oh, God. From 120 to 255, she hung up 15 times. Next. Please, Leah, Leah. Her voice was slurring. I'm so sad. I can't get out. Call me. It's a mess. Two more hang-ups. 320. Very slurred. I don't know what to do. 327. I miss you. Miss you. I bury the phone at the bottom of the pile and put on a heavier sweatshirt before I head to my car. Winter comes early in New Hampshire. <laughs>